Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, Stacy, today we're going to talk about north versus south or south versus north. A little bit of southern gardening talk. I was chatting with a friend of mine, Teresa Watkins. She's with News Radio WFLA in Orlando, Florida. Has a gardening show she does. She's an author. She's a garden designer. And we were just chatting about the differences between southern and northern gardening. And, of course, we've had viewers and listeners who have asked us to touch on the subject. A lot of them, yes. Yeah. As the show's gotten some traction, we've heard from listeners all over the U.S. and all over the world. So we have a lot of fans in hot climates who are a little bit like, hey, what about me? Well, and you know, when you think about gardening down south or landscapes down south, I mean, one of the first things I think about when I've been in, for example, Florida, is the difference as far as turf is concerned. So there you are looking at things like zoysia grass, Bermuda grass, uh, St. Augustine uh, grass. And up here in the north, we have those wonderful cool season blends of Kentucky blue and perennial rye and fescues that you know you just want to take your shoes off and walk uh, barefoot in the grass not so much down south well aside from the uh, texture of their turf you've also got you know scorpions and fire <laughs> ants and snakes and a lot of things that maybe aren't so pleasant to uh, walk on barefoot <laughs> but here's a pleasant thought in the south and Teresa and I talked about this you can garden year-round and we have Snow, that covers our lawns and is the great equalizer. Everybody's yards look the same in the winter time, And you know what? It really makes the, uh, the maintenance industry a big industry in the south also. Again, if you're gardening year-round here, as far as the maintenance industry is concerned, well, we hang some Christmas lights and we plow snow, but it's a big deal down there. It is. And, you know, I think that that really gets to the whole north versus south or south versus north is that I think we look at each other and think, wow, it'd be so cool to garden in that climate. But that ultimately it's kind of like oh, the grass is always greener on the yes. other side, you know, yes. literally and metaphorically. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times helping home gardeners I've heard from them in Texas and in Southern California and Florida saying, please tell me there's a lilac that I can grow here. <laughs> and I usually the answer is no. I mean, there are some heat tolerant lilacs, which we have talked about a bit, but I'm also just like, wait a minute. Why would you want to grow a lilac when you can grow citrus and jasmine? And, and crotons and bougainvillea. <laughs> and all of this really cool stuff yeah. that, you know, I, I, everybody always wants what they can't have. I get that. But, you know, when, they, when they're saying to me, wish I could grow lilacs, I'm going, I wish I could grow lemons. I wish I could grow avocados. That would be amazing. Well, of course, if you're going to garden in the South, one of the things you have to pay attention to, well, actually, if you're going to garden anywhere, you want to pay attention to the soil. And uh, in Florida, they have, uh, they have an interesting kind of soil type there. It's called uh, Mayaca soil. It's a fine soil. Uh, but here's the point. The, the difference being, uh, and one of Teresa's comments to me was, when you add amendments to the soil, and you add organic matter to the soil, you have to pay attention to it because it breaks down so much faster than when we add it to our soils here in the north. Oh, sure. That uh, higher temperature, higher humidity, it's just going to go cycle right through. And there are so many unusual soils in warm climates. You know, growing up in the Midwest and gardening in the Midwest and East Coast, you're kind of like, oh, it's either, you know, like a clay soil or a sandy soil. It's just like, that's it. But, you know, you're going down to Arizona, California, you have totally different um, challenges like boron tolerance. A lot of uh, soils in California are very high, naturally high in boron. Yeah. And there's a lot of plants that can't grow in it. Yep. You go down to, uh, you know, Arizona, there's not a lot of irrigation. So the soils tend to get much more alkaline. There's all of these considerations which, you know, uh, provide opportunity, but also a little bit of a challenge. Well, yeah. And think about humidity, Humidity, that was another subject that came up, you know, here in Michigan, we, we complain about the humidity in July and August, but it's like, you know, right. down there. Wow, in Florida, humidity, and that's part of the reason why plants like lilacs are a problem, uh, growing them there, uh, but also watering. And one of the things that we were looking at is the fact that there's a tendency in 
for example, in Florida to overwater your plants. And so I did a little bit of research and sure enough, Florida is the third highest state in the United States for rainfall, 55 to 65 inches uh, a year. Number one is Hawaii and you have Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama on the list. A state such as ours, Michigan, we're, we kind of fall right in the middle, number 32, with about 33 inches of rain per year. The point is, um, overwatering can become a prop- problem in some of these tropical regions because it's going to create disease for your plants. It does. And, you know, people think like, oh, it's hot. My plants need more water. Exactly. But the fact is, when there is high humidity in the air, the plants don't lose as much water out of their foliage when they're, you know, uh, undergoing photosynthesis. And so they don't need as much. And people are thinking, well, it's hot. Better water my plants. And, yeah, I can't tell you how many warm climate gardeners I've heard from, uh, particularly attempting to grow limelight panicle hydrangea, who have uh, killed or severely set back their plants you know, watering them like they think they should, but just not accounting for that lower water usage that happens under high humidity conditions. Yeah, I think, you know, as far as watering is concerned, if you're in Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, Montana, Arizona, Idaho, that's a whole different matter. But in the South, uh, yeah, just because it's hot doesn't mean you need to pour on uh, more water. Of course, nematodes also are a problem in the South. And there's a real interest in container gardening. And when I've spent time in Florida, run through some neighborhoods, uh, you see a lot of container gardens. Of course, you think about Jack Barnwell and Proven Winners uh, Aqua Pots. Uh, and there in Florida, uh, their ability to use both tropical plants and other plants. I asked Teresa the question, what's as a garden designer, landscape designer, what's one of your favorite plants to use in containers? Because again, you're right, uh, Stacy. we think about crotons and hibiscus and mandevilla and that sort of thing. She said, oh, so easy roses. Oh, interesting. She said roses just do fantastic. The new roses like oh, so easy roses. Also buddleias in containers, very popular and they have a lot of success uh, with them. And then, uh, by the way, she had also mentioned a perennial that's one of my favorites, whirling butterflies. Uh, That is uh, guara, guara, however you want to pronounce it. It's spelled G-U-A-R-A. That's going to be my word of the day, guara, (laughs) because it's tough to say. But that's a perennial that's tough as nails and can handle the heat. Uh, Kind of a neat plant to add to your landscape uh, if you are in the south or even here in Michigan and dealing with heat. A fun plant to grow. I have grown it. A lot of times it's sold as an annual here in Michigan, but it has been a short-lived perennial for me, like for two or three years until, you know, some really wet snow kind of takes it out. But I love that plant. I I love those plants that have like a lot of space and air in them. And I think Gara is a great example of that. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, uh, if you're watching us or listening to us down south, I'm jealous because you get to grow annuals in the winter time. Now we do try to plant a few pansies, some ornamental kale, try and keep them alive a little beyond Thanksgiving day. But uh, again, talking to uh, Kevin Hurd from uh, Proven Winners, Kevin said that in many of their trial gardens, uh, they will plant out annuals in Florida in the winter just to test their cold tolerance. And they, for example, found sweet Caroline uh, Medusa, the sweet potato vine, uh, did quite well in the deep south uh, during the winter because, of course, they can get some cold snaps. But talk about fun being able to plant out annuals. Yeah, it is. it is. You really have to sort of shift your perspective. I know one time I was visiting uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas in early spring, and I said, oh, these are the most beautiful petunias I have ever seen. And how long have you had them planted? And they said, oh, those, we only grow those a few week th- weeks. They're a spring <laughs> annual for us, which for us are like the height of summer exactly. annuals. So. Exactly, yeah. So down south, pay attention to the feeding. You're going to have to pay attention to feeding. Again, with a lot of rain and with the humidity and with the growth, uh, feeding, of course, is going to be very, very important too. 
Uh, we had a show uh, a number of months ago about garden fatigue in the north when we get a little weary of working in the garden. But boy, is it a commitment in the south. It's a year-round thing. <laughs> it is. You never really get a break. Neither do the pests. Not something we've touched on, exactly. but that can be a huge issue for people in the south. But, you know, you get lemons. You get jasmine. You get so many cool things. I have to say I'm, I'm a little jealous. Need I say more? <laughs> Coming up next, Plants on Trial here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Uh, it's time of the show where we put a plant on trial. That means we're going to talk about one of our favorite Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs, and you get to decide if you're going to try it out in your garden. And seeing as how today's show is mostly dedicated to our friends in the warmer climates, naturally, I had to feature a shrub that is very, very heat tolerant. Yes. And that is Center Stage Red Crepe Myrtle. And before we continue, for our YouTube viewers, you got to show them oh, that yes. pen you just tapped on the table. All right. This is my very cool cactus pen that my mom got me at a store called Jellyland oh. in Las Vegas. <laughs> and she got me a bunch of cool pens. The other ones might be a little too distracting to have on air, but this one doesn't move. So um, I brought it. Thanks, Mom. Just showing off my cool pen. And, and it also writes very well. So it's not just it. a cool cactus pen. It also does its job. I love it. Very well. Uh, it has black ink. And the center stage crepe myrtle has black foliage. Uh -huh. Just had to get that little tie-in to bring it back into plants on trial here. You know, you bring that up, though, Stacey, and, and when you look for crepe myrtle uh, online, there is a lot of talk about the dark-leafed or black-leafed uh, crepe myrtles and the pursuit of that. Yes. So uh, I know a lot of our cooler climate listeners are not going to be necessarily familiar with crepe myrtle. There has been more and more being grown in cooler climates as people sort of experiment and find out, oh, hey, it does pretty well. If you go to downtown hall in Michigan, for example, in July and August, you will see quite a few crepe myrtles. That's the uh, holy grail of plant breeding when it comes to crepe myrtle, and that is trying to develop cold tolerance. Uh, crepe myrtle. Right. right. And then the other holy grail is an improved black leaf crepe myrtle. Nice. So now if you aren't familiar with crepe myrtle or you haven't been lucky enough to travel somewhere warmer when they are in full bloom, they are a sight to behold. There really are, I think, fewer, few flowering, usually they're a flowering tree. Ours tend to be more of like a, a shrub, multi-stemmed habit. Um, are, there are a few other flowering trees or shrubs that are just so jaw dropping when they are in bloom. I mean, they are just, it's just thousands and thousands of flowers and the color is so bright that, I mean, you'll stop your car, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's absolutely screaming from out in the landscape. So, pull over first. Pull right, right. Hopefully over. a pull over first, but I, I have been in a situation where I almost <laughs> wanted to slam on the brakes because the crepe myrtles were so beautiful. Um, but you know, so they've been really popular garden plants in the U S for a century, at least, if not longer. And you know, when a plant has been around that long, people start to wonder like, what's next? Like, Hey, I understand great myrtles. They're cool. But like, I want something with a little bit of pizzazz. I want something with a little twist to it. And so these dark leaf or black leaf crepe myrtles started to come onto the market, oh, probably like 15, 20 years ago. And they are beautiful. So what you really have to imagine if you're not familiar with this plant is really super vivid flowers. So they can be red, pink, purple, coral, white. Um, and then when you mix that with that dark black foliage, they wow. just pop against it's really something to see um but the earliest dark leaf crepe myrtles uh as beautiful as they were they were heat tolerant but they did not really appreciate the humidity mm -hmm. so what was happening is these black leaf crepe myrtles were getting powdery mildew now when a plant with green leaves get pow gets powdery mildew it doesn't look so hot but when a plant with black leaves gets powdery mildew and gets that white fuzzy growth all over it you really kind of got a problem on Comes your hands. Evident. yes mm -hmm. there's no hiding that um and so you know when it came for time for us to think about what was our, our take going to be at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs on these black leaf crepe myrtles, we knew that powdery mildew resistance was a non-negotiable. It really was our primary goal is to say, hey, you know, getting good flower color is important. Uh, getting a really nice, rich, dark black color is also important. But all of that kind of just goes out the window if we don't have the performance 
of the plant, the disease resistance, that is actually going to make people want to grow this and not say, oh, I wish that thing wasn't growing because it's just covered in powdery mildew. And so it took us quite a long time to develop it, but most of the work on the center stage series of crepe myrtle was done by our plant breeder, Megan Matai, who was wow, our breeder, or who fantastic. was our guest last week. Yep. Megan's a rock star. Megan, I like her. Megan is a rock star. I like her a whole lot. And she's also the developer of the center stage crepe myrtles. And she specifically cool. mentioned this when we were talking to her last week um, as being one of the plants that she is most proud of. And I think that says a lot. You know, when you have a plant breeder who is devoting their energy to so many different kinds of plants for so long and they say, hey, this is one that's truly innovative. This is one that I'm truly proud of. I think that says a lot about the plant. And for Megan, that is a center stage series. And center stage red is the one that I picked to highlight in today's Plants on Trial because it was the first one. And because I personally find the combination of that black foliage and those bright, bright red flowers absolutely irresistible. Have you seen this plant? Oh, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. And of course, you can go to our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Check out the show notes. And uh, if you're keeping score at home, we're talking about center stage red crepe myrtle. Yes, I have. Beautiful. Let me quickly ask you a minute for, again, those people scratching their heads, uh, riding in the car or at home listening or watching. Crepe myrtle, C-R-A-P-E or C-R-E-P-E. I say C-R-E-P-E because the flowers look like crepe paper. That is where the name originally comes from. I win. <laughs> I should be on Jeopardy. <laughs> if, if, if they have a plant category, I guarantee, or uh, it's a war history category, you'll be on top. I don't know about any other categories, though. Uh, but, um, no, you're right. So we actually use at Proven Winners the crepe, C-R-A-P-E. Okay. Um, they're both technically correct. It's That's kind of just a, you know, yeah. however you want to say it. But either way, however you spell it, that is the derivation of the name crepe is because the flowers do resemble crepe. Do people even use crepe paper anymore? I don't no idea. <laughs> I feel like that's a very antiquated Go to a party store and find kind out kind of thing. All right. Well, hopefully they do, and hopefully people know what the heck we're talking about when we talk <laughs> about crepe paper um, and crepe myrtles as well. Um, so anyway, this is a very very heat tolerant plant. This will easily thrive in USDA zone ten, which is you know almost all of the continental US. It will easily take even the humidity in areas like Southern Florida and Texas. It's not going to develop that powdery mildew that people that might make people a little bit more uh, gun shy on dark sure. leaf uh, crepe myrtles. And that's really you know one of the reasons that it's so great. But we have discovered over time and trialing here in West Michigan that it does have a pretty good cold tolerance as well. So here on the lakeshore, we have had them with the crepe the center stage series survive. Uh, for several years. Now, what will happen typically in colder climates like Michigan, USDA Zone 6, I prob you're probably not going to get a whole lot of success colder than USDA Zone 6, but don't let me discourage you. If you want to give it a try, you never know. Um, but here, what happens is they die back to the ground. So they act a little bit like a butterfly bush or a buddleia or a caryopteris or something like that, where they are dying back to the ground. They're not remaining a shrub that where the growth is going to come out on those stems that persisted over winter. But uh, after, you know, some warmth in the spring, they will start to regrow from the roots. And because crepe myrtle blooms on new wood sure. later in the season, mm -hmm. they actually do go on to flower and look amazing. And by the time, you know, August rolls around, you won't even hardly have noticed that your plant ever even died back to the ground. It's really fun. It's kind of like the hardy bananas that we grow Ooh, yeah. also. The Musa Bijou, mm -hmm. I think, is the name. Uh, again, re starting over, but uh, worth it. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's it's one of those things that really shows you that it pays to be a little bit experimental yeah. in gardening. And, you know, that's one of the things that we do here at Proven Winners in our trial garden is we're testing these things and, you know, seeing, hey, Will it come back? And yeah, we've had great survival on this. So uh, it actually is a little bit more cold tolerant than we had initially thought. We do usually put like a zone seven on it. But I think uh, if you're experimental and you want to give center any of the center stage series a try, if you're in USDA zone six, you're probably going to have pretty good luck, especially if you do find sort of a more protected spot in your yard uh, where you can plant it. But full sun. This is definitely yeah. a full sun plant, especially in colder climates. And even in warmer climates, you're going to want it to be in that full sun so that you get the full color to develop. Anytime that you have those extra pigments that's making foliage, you know, black, purple, those colors, 
if it's in too much shade, it gets to be kind of like a muddy green. Mm. You're not getting like the rich, you know, true kind of tones that you might be seeing in our photos, which of course you can see at the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. You know, if you want to experiment with the plant, you're in good company. George Washington did it in the yeah. 1700s when they introduced crepe myrtle to the U S uh, he wanted one on his, uh, Mount Vernon estate. As I, I understand, I would guess he probably had pretty good success. I would hope he had good success. And by the way, uh, in my reading also, I found that goldfinches love crepe myrtle, the oh. seeds on the tree. At least that's what I understand. So, Hey, you know, again, I didn't know experiment that experiment with it. What a beautiful tree. I love the black or dark leaves. And I love the idea of a yellow and black goldfinch in the black foliage exactly. of the center stage exactly. of Crepe Myrtle. Wow. So this is a great plan if you're looking for something really very colorful and a more unusual color combination. Uh, whether you live in a warm climate or you're an experimental cold climate gardener, check it out, center stage red Crepe Myrtle. And you can see more pictures and all the information you need to grow it at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we're opening up that garden mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's one of my favorite times in the show where we open up the garden mailbag and hear from our listeners around the world, near and far, who have gardening questions. And if you are one of those listeners who has a gardening question, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can email us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. There's a contact form. You can attach a photo. And I have to say, I really do appreciate it when people have specific questions about what's going on in their yard. If you can attach a photo, that makes it a lot easier to help you. So uh, don't hesitate to include that when you reach out to us. And uh, so what do we got in the mailbag today, Rick? Well, not only questions, but comments. A uh, comment from Sharon, uh, again, about hoses. I've got a limerick coming up Ooh. Uh, well, next week. I'll do it for you. A limerick on hoses. But uh, she, among many, told us uh, hose link. That's oh. the answer. And uh, Diane uh, likes word of the day and gave us the word katawampole or katiwampole. That's a great word. I love that word uh, to travel purposely toward an as yet unknown destination. That's what we as gardeners do as you walk the garden path and easily get distracted like you, Stacy, slamming on the brakes to see a crepe myrtle, right? <laughs> I am very easily distracted, especially in oh, the garden. Me too. So. <laughs> me too. Absolutely. Uh, also in the mail uh, bag, thanks. Uh, Marsha sends us a picture. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it here. Or you can go to our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Marsha just kind of celebrating her sister-in-law's uh, old, old jade plant, uh, probably a hundred years old. Uh, many families have either a jade plant or a Christmas cactus mm -hmm. that has been around for a long, long time. And this is a beauty. It is. It has such an incredible form. And jade plants are one of my absolute favorite house plants. They're so easy to grow. They thrive on neglect, yeah. which is one of the reasons they can <laughs> persist for so long. So you get that, you know, link in the, the family chain there that maybe isn't such a great caretaker of house plants. It can even survive them. Yeah. Christmas cactus, the same, same thing. It yep. can handle it. It's kind of like the family fruit cake that's passed on <laughs> through the years. Rhonda writes to us and sends a photo, uh, she and neighbors and other folks panicking because their maple trees are losing leaves, dropping leaves like it's fall, and yet the leaves don't turn color. They're green, and uh, a number of leaves fall to the, uh, the turf. And the concern, of course, being drought and heat. Well, that's not the case, and uh, no need to panic, no need to lose your composture. It's something called maple leaf petiole borer. And, Stacy, I see this all the time here in the north uh, during, well, late May, but usually into the month of June when we see this, when maple trees will start shedding some of their leaves and causing concern for homeowners. This is a uh, sawfly that emerges from the soil, uh, lands on the petiole or the stem of a leaf, usually at the base, lays its eggs, and then the larva just kind of tunnels into that petiole. And at some point when the wind blows, causes some of the leaves to fall off. And it's a, a pretty natural thing. And then the uh, larva will crawl into the ground and the whole cycle will repeat itself again in the coming year. So maybe if you're keeping score at home, you want to Google it or use the search engine of your choice, maple leaf petiole 
board. I have to say, when you told me about this, this is the first I've actually heard of this. Uh, I have never heard of the Maple Leaf Petiole Borer before, so it was very interesting uh, to me to look into it. And, uh, you know, stress also can be a factor, yes. though. Oh, yeah. So it's important to understand that, you know, that might not be the answer, but fortunately there is a very easy way to determine if your plant is losing leaves from the maple leaf petiole borer, and that is that the leaves will not drop at the zone of abscission or that little area where they cling to the actual tree. It'll just kind of be like in the middle of the petiole. Yeah, good point. So if you, you know, go and look at that leaf, at the foliage, it's fallen under the tree, examine that petiole or the stem that connects it to the tree. If it's just kind of like broken off in the center, it's probably the maple leaf petiole borer. No treatment is recommended. Correct. The plant can easily withstand losing that foliage. It has a short lifespan where it's just going to move on. Now, if you are seeing like the whole leaf is coming off and you're actually seeing that leaf base that would attach it to the tree, then you might have a different cause like stress. And certainly the drought that we have had here in Michigan would cause that. But again, that's not really like, oh my gosh, the tree is dying. That's just the tree saying like, whoa, conditions aren't ideal here. I'm going to drop a few leaves so I have a little less to support and hopefully that will get me through these tougher times. And if you are getting uh, like larger branchlets of maple uh, all over that are actually like attached to the little twig, almost certainly squirrels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they like to go around and sometimes they're building a nest and sometimes I think they're just being bored. I, I mean, I don't know the inside of a squirrel brain, but um, I swear sometimes they're just out there and they're just biting them off and letting them fall just for the fun of it. It's their job to get into trouble and chew the propane gas hoses off your gas grill on the back deck. Whoa, so yes. sounds like you're speaking from experience yes. there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other topic for <laughs> down the road. Brandon sends us a note. I garden in West Michigan zone 6A last few weeks. Notice the leaves on my flocks, ultraviolet pink, have started to turn yellow from the base of the plant and appear to be moving up. Could this be related to the warm weather? I water when it's needed. Or could it be a fungal issue? And again, uh, Stacy, uh, flocks susceptible to powdery mildew. There are great garden flocks, tall garden flocks. Uh, there are great uh, varieties. Proven Winners has Luminary and Cover Girl, Party Girl, Glamour Girl. You know, a number of these flocks that have been bred to be more disease resistant. Yet, culturally, with flocks, you have to be important. Uh, you have to be careful. Watering at the base of the flocks, and if you start to see yellowing at the base where we get less light, maybe less air, that eventually works its way up towards being a powdery mildew issue. It can, for sure. And, you know, Brandon did include a photo, which I will put in the show notes, and thank you for that, Brandon. Um, I don't see in his photo any signs of powdery mildew. And, you know, absolutely, this has been such a stressful season for gardeners as well as gardens. Um, and so when I was looking at Brandon's plants, my first thought is that it was a water issue. And, you know, sometimes it can be as simple as like it just went a few days without water, particularly in the spring sure. when the foliage is emerging and it's so soft, it hasn't yet developed that protective waxy cuticle that makes it better able to withstand hot and dry conditions. And so that, that reaction to dryness in that period is going to look a little bit different than, you know, wilting or something in the summer. I don't see any signs yet, but, you know, Rick's absolutely right. Flux is notorious for getting powdery mildew. So I'm not seeing any of that yet. I would say definitely keep watering it. And do bear in mind, too, that um, a lot of times plants will grow and this happens on panicle hydrangeas especially as plants grow and get larger they start to shade their inner leaves exactly they're less effective at photosynthesis because they're not getting as much sun and so they just drop them yeah. they're just like hey i don't need to maintain this you know not very functional leaf anymore it's just it's going away so yeah. um not a huge cause for concern brandon but uh again we appreciate your your message and we'll put your photo and the answer on the show notes brings up a good point uh, there stacy uh and that is when you initially plant them also spacing between the mm -hmm. plants of course very important melissa writes to us hundreds of blooms on her meyer lemon tree in a pot on the back patio but also has discovered hundreds 
hundreds of fire ants in the container too. Yikes! Trying to grow these lemons as organically as possible. She didn't write yikes. I said <laughs> yikes. Uh, do you have a recommendation to get rid of these buggers from my container? By the way, uh, as far as fire ants are concerned and getting into the container, I don't know if Melissa's tried this, but a very fine mesh, I mean super fine mesh over the drainage holes at the bottom of the pot or setting the pot on a drainage saucer. Some people will put a little bit of lemon juice in there. And uh, there's a product called Tanglefoot. There's other names also, but there are sticky substances that you could potentially uh, put along the top rim of the pot. And that may be an organic way also to help with the fire ants. Well, you know, I have to say, uh, as much as I am envious of warm climate gardeners at times, when it comes to fire ants, I am not. Oh, they, are, they are such a nightmare, and I truly <laughs> do pity anybody who has to deal with them, which is most people in the South. Um, so, Melissa, the key to managing any ants, including fire ants, is that you have to kill the queen. So, you know, yeah. Rick gave great advice, and those are all non-toxic methods. Um, but honestly, unless you are doing some sort of control method that actually will kill the queen, she's just going to keep making <laughs> new worker ants, yeah. new drones to keep coming out and you'll keep trapping them, but she'll just keep making more babies. So um, unfortunately, I would say this is a situation where, you know, particularly because fire ants can be harmful to humans and pets, uh, a situation where something a little bit heavier might be in order. Now, the good thing about ant baits, chemical ant baits, is that they really are specific to ants. Yep. You know, this And they is, work. They work. They're very yep. effective and they're not something that like butterflies are going to be affected right. by or anything like that. So if you do a targeted application of an ant bait that's specifically for fire ants and you take care of that queen they they eat it they eat it they take it back to the queen she dies and your fire ant infestation is gone so sometimes that's you know that's just one of the principles of integrated pest management is doing the least uh problematic but most effective thing so melissa i totally understand but i think that uh you will probably be happier with no fire ants and a little bit of a chemical application then you know it's no fun when you have ants in your plants you know, oh, it really it is no fun. <laughs> Melissa needs something that's fire resistant. <laughs> and I think we gave her some well rooted advice. All right. Well, hopefully <laughs> that's helpful. We Sorry. want to thank everybody for writing <laughs> and invite you to reach out to us too at gardening simplified on air.com. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we've got branching, oh, branching news with a special guest. So mm -hmm. you're going to want to find out who that is and stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And without further ado, I've been excited about this. Uh, can't wait. We get the opportunity to interview the Gardening Simplified Show's engineer, producer, videographer, photographer, extraordinaire, Adriana Robinson, Stacy, who is uh, usually on the other side of the camera. And today she joins us on the Gardening Simplified Show. I know we're turning the cameras around and we're finally letting the audience uh, enjoy the amazingness that is Adriana. And of yeah. course, what better topic for Adriana to talk to our audience about than photography? Oh, and photographers can freeze time. I mean, what superpower do you have? Well, Adriana has all kinds of superpowers. And of course, we thank her every week for the work she does here on the Gardening Simplified show. Adriana, thank you. And it's uh, fun to be able to chat with you about gardening photography. I know it feels weird being on camera and having a microphone in front of me, but I am excited. I'm excited to be here with you guys and talk about it. You know, folks who are watching on YouTube, uh, you can see the cameras that I have sitting out on the table here. Knowing we were going to chat with you today, Adriana, I was thinking back to when I first started marketing plants and... Uh, that was years and years ago. Well, 70s and 80s. And we were using Polaroid cameras and snapping pictures and, and then cutting them out with scissors and gluing them to a piece of paper. It's amazing how far it has come today. But uh, Adriana, the work that you do is fabulous work, not only for proven winners, color choice shrubs, but also for the industry as a whole, because we get to work with subject matter that's just amazing. <laughs> that is so true. I can't really imagine, besides animals, probably for me, <laughs> but I can't really imagine having a better subject to photograph than plants. Which I want to ask right off the bat. Do you have a favorite flower you like to photograph? Is there a favorite plant? It's a little hard to say. I like, I mean, I love Budlia, 
But I think plants that have seasonal interest uh, all year round. So oh. I love Temple of Bloom. Any plants that attract pollinators, but I can't say there's any one specific plant. Do you like handheld or going tripod? I mean, when, when do you choose to use a tripod? So I will typically do handheld just because I'm on the go so often. Um, but I will use a tripod anytime I'm filming video because you want it to be stable. And I will use a tripod if I'm doing any kind of long exposure mm. or if I need to have that long exposure to let more light in. So if it's dark out and I need to compensate for that, I'll use a tripod. Mm. So uh, Adriana, I, I love shooting pictures of flowers and plants and I like to get into the worm's eye view, get down low and, and shoot the picture. Maybe rest my camera on a, on a bean bag. <laughs> yes. um, what, what's an, I mean, angles important when you're shooting, uh, shooting flowers, right? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of features on a plant that will either get highlighted or hidden depending on the angle that you're taking the photo at. And I was laughing uh, when I saw that your your worm's eye view. And I was like, yeah, you essentially want to think like a beetle, a bird, and I wrote down beaver because I couldn't think of another. <laughs> but <laughs> like, you know, you want to look, you want to take photos from every angle you yeah. can. Because a lot of the times it'll surprise you what you'll get from something you really didn't think would turn out well. Well, and you know, Stacy, Adriana, it, it just really struck me thinking about, again, the beautiful pictures that you take, Adriana, and the video work that you do. Uh, again, years ago, using these old Polaroid cameras, um, you know, we worked hard at it. We were proud of the work that we did. But today, cameras, the technology is unreal, the editing that can be done. Uh, and yet, there's a real human element to photography. You are trying essentially to, to show others what you are seeing, what you're visualizing and, and freezing that moment in time. Absolutely. You know, I actually went to school for film and video, so I, I knew some things about plants, but I definitely learned a ton since I've been working here. And coming into this job and looking at plants from more of an artistic kind of viewpoint is different than how Megan, our plant breeder, would look at it. Oh, she would see a more scientific side. Sure. So everyone has a different view of things. And no matter how much technology is going to advance, there's always got to be some human element. That's exactly. what makes a photo work. Exactly. You know, I have been lucky to work with Adriana since she started here over five <laughs> years ago. And before she started, we had one person taking, you know, almost all of our photos. And they were great photos, perfectly usable photos. And I remember very quickly... Um, after she started not coming in as a professional horticulturist, um, just immediately noticing the difference in the perspective that she was bringing to, to plants that I had seen dozens of times in person, mm. dozens of photos of. And, you know, you, you don't necessarily think that there is so much interpretation to be had in plant photography. Um, but, you know, I guarantee you that you can round up your whole family on some <laughs> summer evening, pass the cell phone around, tell everybody to take a picture of the same flower, and you will be amazed at the different perspective that people bring and the different results that they get, yeah, even using point. the same materials. And that's what's so fascinating and so interesting about photography. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I look at it as like telling a story. Even with if you and I had the same story, we're going to tell it slightly differently. And that's oh, what makes it work. That's yeah, a really good way to think about yeah. it, yeah. You know, I think part of the beauty also of the work that you do, Adriana, is, again, going back to the 1970s and my Polaroid cameras. If you think about Edwin Land, uh, the gentleman that started Polaroid cameras back in the 30s and 40s, uh, his inspiration was to take pictures of his daughter because he'd shoot pictures of his daughter and she would say to him, well, where's the picture? I want to <laughs> see the picture. And today, of course, we can take a picture and instantaneously see uh, what we have. Now, there are uh, pitfalls also in that uh, some folks shooting pictures with their phone uh, may decide to, shall we call it, filter or overcompensate, or saturate, <laughs> yep. or vibrance, or whatever it may be, and then you kind of get a picture that really doesn't look uh, look real. There's there's an art to uh, to editing pictures. Yes, and I am I lean more on the side of less saturation, yeah. less filters, especially when it comes to plants. You know, you're trying to be authentic and you're trying to show the plant for what it is most of the time, unless you're being stylistic and you want to add some sepia or whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that. 
a lot of people get discouraged with photography because you always have an image in your mind of what you want the picture to look like. Then you go out there and you take the photo and it's nothing like what you want. And I think that's discouraging for a lot of people, but I think a lot of people try to compensate in editing. The the advent of, of digital photography has really taken this plant photography to another level. It has. And it, again, is both exciting, but I know it can be intimidating for people trying to get into any type of photography, really. But plant photography, we're talking about here. And I think a lot of people see all of these, you know, really well done photos. And they think that because they have a better camera, they should be able to just naturally get a better photo. And it's something that you do need to practice and learn. I started off with uh, an Olympus OM-1 film camera. Mm. And I think that was good because I had to learn all of the settings on my camera. I had to learn what they actually do. And once you understand that, your creativity and your limits just expand so much with what you can capture. It's amazing how you'll point a camera at some people and some people will just run, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I'm normally one of them. (laughs) But then, you know, I realized uh, what I was saying to them. uh, Let me point my cannon at you and shoot you. And that's probably (laughs) it. But uh, composition is really an important thing to learn. You know, you mentioned the camera and practicing. You know, I had that same misconception with uh, golf clubs, you know, buying an expensive <laughs> golf club and a bigger golf and going to make me a bet. No, it, it takes uh, it takes practice and work. It's an art. That is if I, I have a couple tips on photography and my first one is to not get discouraged and give up because yeah. it is so easy to do that. I would not have had any of my successes that I've had with video or photography if I did not fail a lot. Yes. Well, that's the great thing about digital photography is it's a lot less oh expensive God. to fail yes. <laughs> than it used to so be. So much better. I think it's also important to understand that like what is a failure for people does vary. Did you fail Absolutely. just because you didn't capture exactly the thing that you thought that you were going to? Uh, but maybe you still got a really good photo- a really good photograph and you learned something. You know, it's not always about, um, you know, what you think you are going for. It's about sort of what you ended up with and what that says. Yeah, it's about the, the journey, not the destination. I think so. <laughs> but it is. It is so much. Everyone is their own worst critic. Myself, I definitely can relate with that. And I think... There's so much serendipitous moments in photography, and a lot of the times that's where my best images have come is just totally unexpected. That's such a good point, too, because there's so much, especially when you're photographing nature, where you might think like, oh, shoot, this bird flew into it, or oh, there was people in the background. And then when you actually go back and look at your photos, it had so much of a, of a sense of time and place to it when you say, oh, yeah, there were people here, but look what they're wearing. Now it's really clear that this was a hot summer day or... You know, there, that all of those things that you might think that you wanted to avoid can actually bring so much to a photo in terms of its time and space and all of those uh, elements that are so much more difficult to capture. You know, it just goes kind of with the telling a story. Every element that you have in within the photo is helping to tell the overall story of what you're trying to show people. So what are some of your other tips? So if we're talking about lighting, I think that is probably the number, you know, like overwatering plants. Bad lighting is probably the number one thing when it comes to photos. So just a quick tip is avoid harsh shadows and highlights. Shooting in the morning and the evening is best or a cloudy, overcast day. Of course, golden hour is always great. And that is the first hour after sunrise and the last hour before sunset. Oh, wow. For composition, uh, something to look into is the rule of thirds. It essentially is if you had a nine grid on your photo. Putting your subject or what you want people to focus on on one of those meetup points on the grid, it's just a good rule to have balance in the photo overall. I think that there's a real interest, Adriana, in uh, shooting pictures of pollinators. I know Ah, I find myself doing that all the time, trying to capture them at work, whether it's a bumblebee or a a hummingbird. uh, Not an easy thing to do, but uh, certainly fun. Yes, no, that is one of my favorite things to do, finding the little hummingbirds and the little battles that they go through. It, it is a challenge, but it is fun. And yeah, macro photography has gotten more popular over the years for sure. And I think it's just a really cool way to get up close and personal and see details about things we normally don't 
notice. There, of course, are different modes also that can be used on a camera. And I'll be honest with you, I struggle with that, trying to decide, well, should I shoot this in landscape mode? Should I use portrait mode? You know what? I'll shoot the same subject subject in every mode and just kind of see how it comes out. Yeah, and that that is That's a what great, I do. great way to do it. <laughs> it does go back to what you are trying to convey or what motion or story you are trying to tell with your photo, right? But as a general rule, if you're taking a wide shot, like you want to get a photo of your whole garden, landscape mode. So it has a deeper depth of field, so more will be in focus in general. And then portrait mode is always great for, you know, pollinator shots or any, if you're trying to just highlight like a single bloom on a plant or something. So that has a shallower depth of field and the background will be more blurred and less distracting, which is what you want when you're trying to get those detailed shots. So our, for our viewers and our listeners, coming from a professional photographer like you, where do you get your inspiration? You know, we asked Megan uh, in a show a week ago, the plant breeder, about, well, have a cup of coffee when you show up to work, and then I think <laughs> I'll try and cross this today. Uh, what about you? Do you go out there and just try to get inspired, or, uh, you know, how do you approach that? Yeah, plants, they're just interesting in general. So it's not very hard to go out and just be like, oh, that looks good. That's interesting. That's pretty. Um, you know, I really got interested in photography because I was pretty shy as a child. So it was kind of a way for me to explore and see the world at mm. a comfortable distance that I, I wanted. I like that. And from that, I've been able to learn so much and notice different details that I never would have before. So it makes me more excited to go out there and just keep doing it. So inspiration is everywhere. You know, uh, there's a, a t uh, quote that I share a lot when I give talks uh, from Orson Welles, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. Mm -hmm. um, if you have free reign, it can be very hard to figure out sort of where to focus. So do you find, you know, when we say, hey, we need a shot of this in fall or, you know, we're going to be introducing this plant just get as much photography on it as you can. Is that freeing or is that kind of stifling? You can honest answer honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit of both and it, it, it is dependent. I mean, I would, with photography, it's like, yeah, there are certain shots I just have that vision in my mind. So I'm going to, you know, try to plan accordingly and make sure I'm getting whatever I need to to get that shot I have in my mind. But a lot of times I'll go and just find like what makes this plant unique, what makes it different. If I just saw this plant, what would interest me with it? But Adriana, you make a great point for our viewers and for our listeners of the Gardening Simplified show. And I mean this sincerely that, you know, I get I, I'm privileged. I get the opportunity to work with two ladies who are very intelligent and very very, very creative. And, uh, you know, Stacy, your use of words, your copywriting helps convey to people the benefits of these plants. And same for you, Adriana, when you're shooting those pictures, uh, through the lens of your camera, you're showing the benefits of whether it may be a sky view hydrangea or seven suns temple of <laughs> bloom. And, and that's fantastic. And it's great for our listeners and our viewers and folks who appreciate the, uh, the gardening industry. You need that. We need to be shown the benefits of these plants well the best part is to be part of a great team yeah there you go <laughs> so true yeah no i totally agree folks i hope you've enjoyed this this gives you a chance to meet adriana robinson she's the one who makes uh, the gardening simplified show go Stacey. she does yeah so she thank makes us you all look adriana good. Oh, thank Appreciate you including both. herself <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your work yes thank you both okay a big thank you very much to adriana robinson stacy a picture's worth a thousand words it is, and I think we got a little bit of both this time. I think we got an inside <laughs> look at the Gardening Simplified Show. Again, thanks so much to Adriana for joining us as our guest today. Thanks to Rick, and thanks to all of you for listening. We hope you have a great week.